Hey guys, welcome back to Fix It Friday. So this week I am very excited to be talking about installing the new Pixel FX Retro Gem into the FAT PS2. So this is the first digital to digital solution for outputting video and audio via HDMI on your PS2. Um, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Uh, this project has been in the pipeline for quite some time, I think a few years, and um, it's now released. And uh, this particular mod, the Retro Gem, is awesome in the sense that it can be used on a number of different consoles. So you can install it in the PS1, uh, which I've already shown, um, in the Nintendo 64, uh, the PS2, the fat models, and the slim models, um, and also the Sega Dreamcast. So it's a pretty versatile mod. And uh, to s put it together succinctly, what it does is it takes the digital audio and video directly from the PS2. It outputs it at up to 1440p without any noticeable input latency of any kind. And it has all sorts of awesome features, including motion adaptive deinterlacing, which is really important for the PS2, and also all sorts of scanline options to give it more of a CRT look and feel. So today what we're gonna be doing is installing this into my uh, console from early adulthood. So I bought this around, I think 2000 and 2001. Um, it's a 39,000 model, and uh, so I'm going to show you how to take this thing apart, um, install it safely, and then we will give it a quick test. All right, let's get to it. Okay, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time than usual on the teardown step uh, for this PS2, mainly because taking apart PS2s is kind of annoying. Uh, there's a lot of different hardware versions, and so what I'm showing you today is specific for the 39,000 series. It may work on other models, but, um, but there, again, Sony made so many differences uh, in hardware. So what I'm showing you here will probably not apply to other versions of the hardware. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm taking extra time on this because it's honestly rather easy to break something when taking apart a PS2. I've actually had a number of customers come to me with PS2s that they accidentally broke just because they were trying to take the thing apart and clean it. So that should give you an indication of just how fragile these things are. Um, all right, so with that out of the way, first step is we're gonna be removing eight screws on the back here. Four of them on this side here are long, the four over here are short. So I use this little spudger tool just to make life easier um, to take off the, uh, the little protective flaps here. So you just get that under and if you twist, they come right out. And if you do it like that, you're not gonna break the plastic pegs that hold this thing in place. Uh, you can use your fingernail, but I do find that the more, it's not that convenient and, and you, people tend to break them that way. Um, the rubber feet come off rather easily too. And this I feel like is fine with your fingernail. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and take off the top. And to do that, you actually lift, this is the back of the console, you just kind of lift that up and carefully just angle it off of the front like that. And now I'm just gonna rotate it. And as you can see, there is a flex cable right over here, and this connects the power and eject uh, mechanism. Uh, people break this all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've opened up a console and somebody ruined this thing. So to take it off safely, I use the spudger tool again. I slide it under near where the flex cable is, and if you just kind of like twist it like this, like counterclockwise, you'll lift it off of the pegs safely. You won't break the flex cable, you won't break the pegs that attach it here, and now this thing is free, and it just makes everything much easier to work on. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is remove a couple of screws on the top here. This should allow us to flip it upside down and then remove the bottom half of the plastic. So there's two here on the controller port. And then there's two right here near the power switch. And I think that's it. I'm actually just gonna remove this just to be sure. You can just slide this up. Oh yeah, okay, so there is one more hidden under the power switch. Okay, so that's five screws total, and they're all the same. You don't have to separate them anyway. Okay, so now if we flip this upside down, 
the plastic lid comes straight off. And now we have access to the bottom. So one thing that's important to note on the 39,000 series is that the power supply and the bottom RF shield, um, all of these parts are not compatible with the retro gem. So you either need one of two things. You either need a donor 50,000 series PS2 motherboard, um, or not a motherboard, sorry, a, uh, a console. And you can take the shielding and the power supply from that and swap it onto here. They're all pin compatible and that will allow you to work um, with the gem. The other option is to take um, a re-PSU, which is a modern power supply replacement, and install that instead. Um, in my case, I have a donor 50,000 PSU, so I'm going to use the guts from that one and transplant these working guts into that one, um, and that should take care of the problem. All right, so let me go ahead and continue taking this off. Okay, so I think that's all of the screws and I'm just gonna remove the fan too, which is right over here. And I think the only thing that is holding the bottom RF shield into place are some plastic tabs that just keep it locked down. So I'm just gonna work on that right now. All right, so sorry that was a little bit uh, awkward on my part. There were, there were three locks on the shield on mine, right over here, here, and here. So that just took a little effort. Um, but yeah, as you can see, I'm not deliberately tearing down everything. So I'm gonna leave the DVD drive in place. Um, I may disconnect this just for convenience because it's easy to reattach this. Uh, this is the power and eject right here. Um, but I'm not gonna touch the, the DVD drive. In fact, I'm gonna actually reattach um, at least one or two screws here just so that everything kind of can stay in place and doesn't flop around. I'm also leaving the controller port attached because this thing is a bit of a pain. Um, well, maybe from here, I can, actually, yeah. You know what, this is easy enough to, to disconnect. So you can potentially lift this up and pull that out. Um, but yeah, uh, so, so we're basically all set now. Um, so let's go ahead and take a closer look at the board. All right, so I had a second thought about it, and I think I might go ahead and show you how to take the DVD drive out, just because a board completely isolated like this is definitely easier to work on under the microscope, and that's definitely how I plan to do the soldering for the, uh, the Flex later on. So let me show you this. This is with the 39,000 series. Again, this might not be applicable to the other versions. So you can see you have a few Flex cables right over here. So this one, you lift up this latch, and you just pull the connector out, and then this one's friction fit, and so are these. But you have to be careful because the glue on this little plastic um, locking tab here, this, this can come loose. Um, and then as a result, this is not gonna fit back in here. So you definitely wanna be very careful with these cables if you choose to do this. Um, the official Pixel FX guide says again that this is optional, but just for me, I'm gonna go ahead, I've had experience taking these apart and putting them back together. Um, and just for the convenience of using it under the microscope, it's just better to have this thing off. And then finally, we're gonna go ahead and remove the controller as well. So you just flip this lock up, and as you can see, it just falls right out at that point. Okay. All right, and then finally, the entire uh, top half. I think we can choose to leave this on if we want to. It doesn't interfere um, with the rest of the installation. All right, so let's go in from here. Okay, so most of what we're gonna be doing today is gonna to be located right here. This is the DAC, the digital to analog converter for the PS2. And so we have a flex cable that is gonna be positioned right about here or so. And it's gonna solder on to um, either this chip directly or to this resistor array that is um, connected to the chip. So the first order of business is gonna be removing a couple of components. So there's two ceramic capacitors 
up here that need to be removed. There's also a ceramic cap here and a resistor that need to be removed on the bottom. Um, I have a GH019 revision board. So if you have a different board, the components you might need to pull off are going to be maybe not the same as mine. So absolutely take a look at the official install documents and just see what you have to do. Um, but yeah, this applies to a GH019 revision. So let's go ahead and start by removing those components. So we're just going to apply solder on both sides, just like that. And they just come right off. And I'll follow up with some braid and then just flatten them out so that they don't get in the way. All right, so those surface mount components are now out of the way. So the next thing we're going to do is get rid of this. This is the toss link. So the mini HDMI is going to be located there once we're all done. Um, there's more than one way of pulling this thing off, but I think what I'm going to do is just, it's these three points right here. So I think what I'm going to do is just heat these up at once and then just bend the toss link and it should just come right off without too much trouble. Yeah, that's very easy, actually. Just heating them up and pulling, and it comes right off without any damage. So I could potentially re-solder this back on in the future if I ever wanted to. Okay, but knowing me, I probably won't. <laughs> All right, so now with that out of the way, we're going to turn our attention over here to where the controller uh, gets attached. And so there's a controller flex PCB that you have to install. <clears throat> this is really, really tiny. So I'm going to do my best to show this on camera, but I know I'm going to have to switch to the microscope. And that's something I unfortunately have to do off camera, but let's go ahead and try to get in a little bit closer and I can show you what I'm going to be doing next. Okay, so I switched over to my high power microscope and I um, use this for filming because it's just much easier. But in order to do the initial attachment, I actually used a different microscope, my binocular scope, um, because you have depth of field. So now I'm coming in with some flux and I'm using a fine tip to just work over each of the pads and make sure that they are connected to the pins. Um, so with this particular installation, you have a couple of choices about what to do with the solder that you use. So you can either use leaded solder like I'm doing here, and you can mix it very thoroughly with the lead-free solder that's on the PCB. You can also remove all that lead-free solder and replace it entirely with leaded solder. Or you could do a lead-free install and just use lead-free solder throughout the entire thing. I personally don't care much for lead-free solder, and so in this case, I decided it would be best just to mix them together. And so yeah, what you can see me doing here is just mixing them, making sure that all the points are connected, using plenty of flux to make sure that there aren't any bridges between the pins. And I do this here on camera, but I also go back with my binocular microscope because that has depth of field and it's way easier to work with versus this thing right here. Um, so, so yeah, so that's basically the process that we're going through. And then afterwards you can test to make sure that there aren't any shorts between the pins and you can also take your multimeter and go side by side and make sure there aren't bridges between pins as well. And so that's what you can see me doing right here. All right, so now that the controller flex PCB has been installed, we're gonna go ahead and proceed with installing the main flex that goes on the DAC right here. So it's essentially gonna sit like this, and it's going to go against these resistor arrays that gives us the RGB lines. And um, then there's a whole row of uh, pins it needs to contact on this side and this side. You'll notice that I put some Kapton tape on the PCB. This is just to avoid any accidental shorts um, between the 5 volt connection, which is right here, and these pins over here. So this just protects against any accidents uh, that may or may not happen. Um, so yeah, that's essentially it. The only other thing to mention is this little crystal oscillator right here. So um, the problem with it is that it's actually not little at all. It's rather tall. Um, so you can... Um, install with it still in place, but it's definitely harder to do that because uh, it just gets in the way of the flex. 
So you can replace it with a lower height um, modern crystal oscillator, and uh, I'll have a link in the description for that. That's also something that Pixel FX suggests, but it's not mandatory. Uh, in my particular case, I'm not going to change out the crystal, mainly just because I don't have any on hand, and I really don't want to wait. <laughs> I really can't wait to try this. I've been wanting this for such a long time, and uh, I'm pretty sure I'll be fine with handling the installation, even though it's here. Um, but if you're, you know, relatively new at doing these installs, I would absolutely highly recommend removing this thing and replacing it with the shorter height version. Uh, all right, so we're going to switch over to the other camera, and let's get started. Okay, so just as before, I used the binocular microscope to um, just tack everything down because it's way too difficult to do it with this higher power scope. Um, so everything's tacked down, but not every pin was connected. And so now I'm coming in with my chisel tip and you can see that I'm going up and down on each pin using plenty of flux and just a small amount of solder at the edge of the tip. And you want the solder not just to make a connection from underneath, but also from up above and create something that's called a fillet. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do here. Um, I, again, just like I did on the controller flex, I'm washing the solder, meaning that I'm mixing the leaded solder with the lead-free solder that's currently on the board. Um, you really have to do that thoroughly uh, if you're gonna go with leaded solder because um, otherwise cracks can form with thermal expansion over time and your solder joints will break. Um, but yeah, as long as you mix, you should be totally fine. So there is one thing I do here which is a mistake. So I'm gonna be working on the right side of the chip and I'm not quite so careful with my chisel tip, and I accidentally desoldered one of those ceramic capacitors on the flex cable itself. So if you're doing this install, just be mindful when you work on this side that you don't um, accidentally swipe off that cap. Thankfully, I was able to find it, <laughs> and I reattached it off camera, so it wasn't the biggest deal. Yeah, you can see right there, I just swiped it. Um, but yeah, it all worked out in the end. Okay, so the next step is to take out your multimeter, put it into continuity mode, and start doing a bunch of tests on your work. Uh, the reason why is that um, you want to make sure that these connections are really solid before you close up the PS2, because it's really annoying to take apart the PS2 um, after testing, and if you find that there's a problem, like a short somewhere, it's really a pain in the butt to go back and um, disassemble and then reassemble the console. The other thing is that you want to make sure that there are no shorts between ground and any of the power rails because obviously that would create problems for you. So what I'm doing right here is I'm testing between the legs of the flex cable and the tops of those resistor arrays just to make sure that I have a good connection between them. Uh, if I don't, then I need to reflow and make sure that the connection is strong and solid. I think I ended up having to reflow about two or three connections overall. The next set of tests you need to do is to go from one pin to an adjacent pin and make sure there aren't any bridges between them. Um, so with this installation, it's actually a pretty difficult one and this stuff is all very small. So it's really easy for a bridge to happen and not even notice it. Um, if there's a bridge, you can just apply more flux and have a clean iron and you can wick it away, or maybe with a little bit of solder braid, you can wick it away. Um, there are some places where there are intended to be shorts. So on the left-hand side of the chip, there's four pins that are ground. So all of those should be connected to the same thing. Um, so that's about really the important things that you need to do here. Just be thorough and make sure everything is well connected. Okay, so at this point, all of the difficult stuff is really out of the way. And so what we're gonna be doing now is taking a wire and just attaching it to the five volt regulator on the PS2 and connecting the other end to the pad that supplies five volts to the retro gem. Um, so yeah, it's a really straightforward thing. I ended up using a thicker gauge wire, but I later found out that I could use something like 30 gauge Kynar wire and that would be fine. Um, I mean, really you have plenty of options here because a thick wire is just fine. You have plenty of room for something like that. So, um, but yeah, from what I've read afterwards, you can use something finer gauge and it's okay. 
Okay, so we're also going to go ahead and take the other end of the controller flex PCB and attach it to the main flex. So what I do here is just add a little bit of solder onto one of the pads and then just come in with the controller flex. And uh, it's a little bit tricky to get it lined up exactly the way you want. I think I've ended up using my hands. Um, but uh, once you get it lined up exactly the way you want, then you can just tack it down and then solder in the remaining pads to get everything all the way you want. Okay, so the soldering is almost complete and there's really only one other thing left to do, which is to run a wire all the way from this pad right here, pad number five, all the way down to the far end of the board, um, right over here to this little pad right here. So this is the reset line. So this lets you do in-game reset just by going from here to here. So once that's done, there's only one little bit of soldering left to do, and that is on the retro gem itself. All right, so let's finish this thing up. Okay, so the last little bit of soldering that we have to do on the retro gem is on the board itself. And basically all you have to do is just set a bunch of jumpers to tell the board what it's being connected to. So in this case, we are connecting the gem to a PS2. And so you close jumpers C, D, E, and J. And I believe that this is true for all revisions of the PS2. It doesn't matter whether it's fat or slim or any of that kind of stuff. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, we are now ready to start testing this thing and seeing if it works. So the first thing we're gonna do is partially reassemble the console and we are going to test uh, analog video. Okay, so I have the PS2 partially reconnected and we are going to just do a quick test here. So you can see here, this is the power supply that I got from the donor. So this is a 50,000 series PS2 uh, power supply. Um, and it might not be clear, but I actually have the little plastic spacer um, also installed. And that is extremely important here because um, this thing has mains voltage. It has 120 AC in the United States and 220 in Europe. So. Um, if you don't have that spacer on, you can very easily fry some stuff, destroy your board, maybe start a fire, maybe kill yourself. <laughs> so very serious, absolutely do this carefully and safely by having that plastic spacer inserted. So um, I've gone ahead and plugged the console into mains voltage. I also have the uh, AV multi-out plugged in as well. And so now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna test the console with analog video. Um, it should boot up and we wanna see normal colors and normal behavior. Um, I already know that there's not gonna be any shorts because I already tested um, for shorts on the 3.3 volt rail and the five volt rail and there aren't any shorts um, on the primary voltages coming into the console. So there shouldn't be any issues there, but you know, there might be issues with the pixel bus. So there might be some shorted um, uh, components on those resistor arrays, for example, we don't know. Uh, I don't think so, but this is partly why we're testing on analog. So let's go ahead and turn it on and have a look. Okay. All right. <laughs> ah, that's a relief. Okay, so it's booting into the normal main menu and all the colors at least seem to be there. Uh, so this is a really good sign. This means that our, our console is working um, there's stuff I need to test like the button combination and all that, but to do that, I have to actually have things plugged in via HDMI. So what I'm going to do now is actually, uh, turn this thing off and we're going to go ahead and start assembling using the RF shield from the 50,000 series PS2. Okay. So here is the bottom shield from the 50,000 series PS2 that I, um, I took. So I actually took my 30,000 shield and power supply and I actually successfully transplanted that. So, so if you do this, you know, don't feel like you're killing one PS2 to install it into another. You can actually switch all that stuff onto the other PS2 and it will work just fine. So 
I'm gonna go ahead and then just do the one and only case mod, and it's this one piece right here. This is the shielding for the toss link. Uh, this is the toss link that we removed much earlier. So all you gotta do is just bend this back and forth, and um, it should just come right off. So it's not that complicated to do, and you just gotta make sure that this piece is nice and flat, which it is, and that's it. All right, so let's go ahead and start reassembling this thing. Okay, so there actually are a few more steps that need to be followed here for um, a 39,000 like this that you are using the shield from a 50,000. So the first thing is this little piece right here. There used to be a little piece of metal pointed upward over here and you're supposed to just bend it flat. I actually ended up accidentally breaking it off, but honestly, I don't particularly think that matters. I don't think it's gonna get in the way or do anything. Um, so yeah, it's out of the way and I shouldn't have any issues there. Uh, the other issue, which is very important, is these pins right here. So this piece here has to be uh, shortened. So all of this plastic here has to get cut off. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, take care of that and I'll show you the final result. All right, so the console is a little bit closer to fully assembled. I've got the fan back in and the power cord, um, which routes right underneath here. Um, so all of that is ready to go. And so now I'm gonna try to put the, uh, the shield, the modified shield back on. So the first thing I've got to do is just take this little spacer here. This needs to sit right here in that little spot. And now from here, hopefully we can get this thing to attach. Okay, I think that's about right. Um, so you can see that the flex just comes in from here and now I just got to reassemble everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that, reattach the power supply, and then we will move on to the next step. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and get the um, retro gem all set up. And so first thing we've gotta do is uh, just take this adapter piece here and slide it into this 3D printed mount. And this in turn is gonna go into the gem like so. So now we've got this whole, this whole setup like this. And from here, we're gonna attach it to this mount right here. So it's gonna ultimately sit something like that, more or less. Um, so what we need to do really is just thread these screws through. I'm just gonna start by just threading these together. This just helps keep everything stable. And now with this larger mount here, we have these, uh, let me see if I can shine the light better. There we go. We have these little brackets for holding the nuts in place. And that's two. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to pull this off, but <clears throat> once those are in, I'm just gonna line up the screws and tighten them on the nuts. Nope, that one did not work. This one is going to though. You don't want to over tighten them too. You'll damage the uh, PCB, which we definitely don't want. There we go, that one's in. All right, so I'll just do this final one off camera and uh, then this thing should be almost ready to go. Okay, so this final step drove me crazy, but <laughs> I think I finally have it all set up. Um, so what I found is that uh, a few extra things need to be done in order to get the gem to sit properly here. One was that I had to kind of move a few things out of the way, so I flattened these guys out. I had to um, partially desolder this and just kind of loosen it just to push this safety cap out of the way. Um, I also found that these pins here where the power comes in um, were just a bit too high. So I actually snipped them uh, with my flush cutters so that they're you know, flush with this piece of plastic. And just out of extra precaution, I put a piece of Kapton tape 
on the underside of the gem just to make sure that nothing makes contact that isn't supposed to. Um, and then over here, I also found that I had to trim the sides of the optical port just a little bit in order to get the part to fit correctly. Um, that was not really a big deal. Now, the final part um, is that once the gem is mounted in place like this, you need to use these um, machine screws to lock it into place. So there's one that's slightly longer that goes here. There's a shorter one, and that one should go here. So let's go ahead and get this thing put in. Okay. And finally, this is the Wi-Fi connection here. So we're gonna use this for firmware updates and what have you. And that is gonna end up just living right over here. So I just need to remove the adhesive, or the paper on the adhesive rather. Okay. And let me just adjust this a little bit, there we go. And then that guy just sticks right over there on that piece of metal. Okay, so we should be pretty much done at this point. I'm gonna go ahead and do the final case assembly and then I'll show you how it looks in the end and we'll do a final test on HDMI. Okay, so everything is finally fully assembled and man, I've gotta say, it just took me quite a while to get this thing buttoned up. I. Um, Really wasn't anticipating that, <laughs> but it, it ended up just being a couple of unexpected things that I just um, really wasn't anticipating from reading the install documents. But uh, but yeah, anyhow, the um, the thing I wasn't expecting is that I had to slightly uh, enlarge in the spot here where the optical port used to be because this 3D printed mount really didn't quite fit, and actually the mini HDMI would not have fit either. It was just ever so slightly uh, too big to fit in the original port. Um, so I had a cut over here and also on the top as well to make everything fit. Um, but you know, that wasn't the end of the world. Now that that's all done, everything fits perfectly and it actually looks really clean on the outside. I think that's one of the things I really love about the pixel effects installs is that everything looks really clean and it's either a no cut solution or, you know, very minor cutting. So this was extremely minor, all things considered. Um, so I've gone ahead and installed my hard drive back in here. I have a whole bunch of games, so I'll use this to test. Um, and then I've also got my memory card and I have this, this um, new open source memory card which um, has a micro SD in it. So it lets me save um, basically as many games as I want onto it. So it's super convenient. Um, so yeah, let's go move over to the test bench and let's see how this thing performs. Okay, so I've got the PS2 plugged in and this is my new test station that I'm using just to run various tests on any consoles that come in to my workshop. Um, so yeah, I've got um, my hard drive installed here, which has a full complement of games. And then I've got, um, you know, OPL that I'm gonna use to just demonstrate and test this. So let's go ahead and give it a test and see how things look. All right, that's a very good sign. There we go, looking beautiful. Um, this uh, TV, by the way, it's a 42 inch plasma TV. I literally found it on the curb <laughs> in perfect working order. I didn't have to do anything to fix it, but it's an older set. So um, bear in mind that the blacks on this are pretty bad. Um, that's not reflective of the retro gem. That's just the fact that this is an old TV, but it's very good for my purposes because it runs up to 1080p and I can do all sorts of tests with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and get OpenPS2 Loader running, and I'll just pick some game, and then we can go through the RetroGem menu and see what it can do for us. All right, so we're in the main menu for OPL, and I'm just gonna pick uh, Jack and Daxter. I mean, there's so many good PS2 games, it's really hard to just pick something here, but I'm just gonna try this, and let's just see how it looks.
All right, well, so far so good. But yeah, I mean, I can already tell everything is super crisp and the motion adaptive deinterlacing makes a huge difference with the retro gem because most PS2 games are 480i content. And so you need a way of deinterlacing that. And the older way of doing this was with something called Bob deinterlacing, but that gives you a lot of flicker. Um, this motion adaptive deinterlacing, it looks a lot better. This is something that's also present in other, um, other devices like the RetroTINK 5X, I believe has a similar kind of thing in place. Um, but yeah, I can tell you that the PS2 looks just absolutely incredible. It's way better than what I was used to on the OSSC, which is how I was previously using this console. So let me go ahead and go into the menu and actually test everything to make sure that it's working because I haven't actually done that yet. So to do that, you hit L1, R1, the right button and circle. And that brings us into the main menu right here. So uh, this menu is basically the same as what you see on other retro gem, um, you know, installs on different consoles. The thing I wanna do is go here into system and I wanna go to the debug self-test. And as you can see, there are hearts all across the board. So the clock looks good. All of the RGB lines look good. Everything has a heart. If there is an X on this list when you do the installation, that means that either a connection is missing or maybe two neighboring connections are bridged together. Either way, something is wrong. And you would also see this in the composite video test, which is why I did that first. Um, but yeah, I suspected that this was gonna look fine because again, if composite looked bad, it would have, um, it would have shown something here. Um, so yeah, everything is looking great. Um, I'm not really gonna go into all the features of the RetroGem because that's kind of a video of its own and that's really not the kind of videos I do. I mainly focus on installations here. Um, but you can go up to 1440p. So if you go into output resolution here, you can go very high up into 1440p. You have all sorts of options for scan lines to give it more of a CRT effect, which actually really does make the PS2 look very nice. Um, so yeah, overall, I have to say that I am extremely happy with the results of this mod. Um, it looks outstanding. It makes it extremely easy to set up and connect this PS2 to any television, just plug and play basically. Um, and so yeah, that's why I really wanted to install this on my personal console. All right, so that's it for this week's video. Um, if you guys like this kind of content, then consider subscribing to the channel. I'm gonna have videos out like this um, every week. And then of course, if you have a PS2 that you want this installed in, or if you have any console that needs to be repaired or modified, you can always reach me directly at oneuprestorations.com. All right guys, well, thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.